There are two dilemmas that rattle the human skull. How do you hold on to someone who won't stay? And how do you get rid of someone who won't go? From Pod 617 Productions, it's Shine On, a presentation of Berkman, Botker, Newman, and Shine. Now here's your host, attorney Evan Shine. Episode 23 of the Shine On podcast, I'm Evan Shine. We have a great episode today and a tremendous guest. I can't wait to talk with our featured guest this week. On today's episode, I am joined by author and professor Catherine Sanderson. She's the chair of psychology at Amherst College and the author of the book, The Positive Shift, Mastering Mindset to Improve Happiness, Health, and Longevity. We're going to talk to Catherine about the science of happiness, her research from the field of positive psychology on the factors that do and do not predict happiness. We will talk with Catherine about the role money, marriage, friends, children, and our close and intimate relationships play in making us feel happier. Catherine will give us her strategies to increase psychological well-being and things that you can do in your own life to feel better and feel happier. We will talk to Catherine about the link between age and happiness and how that may impact divorce at certain time periods in our life. I'm thrilled to have Catherine Sanderson on today's show. My interview with her is coming up on the other side of this week's docket. This is an interview that you would not want to miss. Well, Evan, the docket machine is primed and ready to go once again. Are you ready, my friend? Dave, let's do it. Okay. And now, let's see what's on the docket. Well, it's another special edition of the docket and one of our media editions, you might call it. And I cannot take credit here, Evan, decided that an episode of Billions, a show which I'm somewhat familiar with, but Evan, you were schooling me on it. And this scene we're about to watch is exemplary of something. Divorce, relationships? Do you want to cue it up at all? Sure. Divorce, relationships, business, negotiations. We'll get into the clip and then we'll we'll talk about it. Okay. Fun. Here is a scene from the TV show Billions. Goddamn subpoena. A demand for disclosure. As is within my rights. I care not a whit, as you might put it. What I do care about is what are you trying to get out of this look under the hood? Fair play. Getting what I am owed. Simple as that. We had an independent valuator come up with that number. Our very own Jonathan Mardukas. Who knows what kind of circles your in-house accountant spawn him in, though. No. This is about control over me one last time. Or is it part of your endless pursuit of acts? Mm. What, you want a Trojan horse into his books? No plan. Do you want to be done? Then let's be done. Pay me off, lump sum, in the next 48 hours. 48 hours? For that kind of money? Or I'll be in first thing next week to take a gander. Or a perusal, or maybe I'll just take a piece of the company. Hmm? There's no way that's happening. These are reasonable options. It's either the Burt Reynolds spreader or a go-away payoff. The divorce judge will see that as fair. Because it is. Tell us what struck you about that scene. Well, Dave, first, Billions is back in, and look, that means more Axe, more Wags, more <laughs> Wendy and Chuck, and more Dollar Bill, and I love it. First, if you haven't seen the show Billions, stop what you're doing right now stop actually i take it back finish this episode first <laughs> then go ah, then talking. go binge watch all the, the the seasons of billions trust me and you can thank me later <laughs> second if you haven't read the article by sean collins in the new york times from september 12th read it it gives a great recap of billions season five and dives into the relationships in the show and the personalities and the egos and the emotion that make up the great storyline in season five. And third, and before we get to the clip, this season of Billions in particular is an absolutely great example of what happens when we let emotions lead decisions. This is true of Bobby Axelrod in this season, and it's true in the divorce world. We see Bobby Axelrod in Billions, who runs Axe Capital, making decisions that affect billions and billions of dollars, companies, industries, employees, And we see here how his desire in this season to take on, or should I say take out, arch rival Mike Prince clouds his judgment and his ability to think clearly. And look, there's a lot of parallels between billions and divorce. 
last episode, we talked about the similarities between running a company and parenting. And we see similarities with the way Axe runs his company and how the emotion of divorce can take over. This is why having the team of support to help you through the process is so important. The legal team, the financial team, the emotional support team. So when you're negotiating your divorce and making perhaps arguably the most important decisions of your life on your financial future and the financial future of your children, these decisions can be made by separating the emotions out from looking at what may make the most financial sense. Now, let's get into this clip. You see the divorce unfold between Wendy and Chuck. You hear the words demand for disclosure, subpoena, independent evaluator. And I want to first mention quickly what these words mean and the implications, and then talk about the absolutely brilliant scene that takes place between Wendy and Chuck and the negotiation. First, the demand for disclosure, we've talked about it before in episode nine with Glenn Liebman. That's a document that gets served on the other spouse through the lawyers requesting and demanding various financial documentation, bank statements, credit card statements, or in this case, business records for Wendy's employment at Axe Capital. The documents requested are for a spouse to produce voluntarily through the lawyers. Now, subpoenas, you heard that word mentioned in the clip. If documents are not received in response to the document demand, subpoenas are sent directly to the institutions seeking compliance from the companies directly, a bank or an institution and a subpoena may or may not be signed by a judge. The filing and serving of a subpoena, it also prompts different actions. A motion could be made by the corporate attorneys who represent the company or the bank to to squash the, to quash that motion or that subpoena. And now you have an independent business evaluator. For this, again, flashback to episode nine with Glenn Liebman, but look, an independent evaluation could be an invasive, a lengthy, and quite frankly, an uncomfortable process into the business, and books and records are turned inside and out, and each and every last detail and transaction is scrutinized. And as we see in this clip, Wendy wants this avoided for two reasons. One, as I mentioned, it's invasive. And two, she has a loyalty and a relationship to acts. Now, some of the lines in, in, in this clip are absolutely pr- priceless. And you see the great power dynamic between Wendy and Chuck. Wendy says, what are you trying to get out of this? Look under the hood. This is about control. Chuck responds, Dave, by saying, you want this done? Pay me off lump sum in the next 48 hours. And see, here's the thing you see in the clip and you see in divorce negotiations. Chuck really doesn't care about the subpoenas, the document demands, the valuation. He wants control. He wants to exert the power and throw around the control that at this exact moment he has. And this power over Wendy, it's really power over Axe. Control over Wendy equals control over Axe. And he knows that Wendy would do absolutely everything to protect him. And therefore, he could have demanded twice the sum he did. She'll do what she has to, to get the money, to pay him, and to finalize the divorce. A lot of times when these shows are viewed by professionals like yourself, the professionals squawk at the lack of accuracy, but it, it sounds like they must have a pretty good technical consultant on this show. It sounds like what you're saying is that the terminology they were using were fairly true to life and that, that an exchange like this could actually happen. Could it? it not only did, could it happen, it does happen and it happens a good amount of the time, especially mm-hmm. when the amount of money that you see at play here in businesses, you see it more often than not. Now I caught something that maybe you didn't. Did you did you know that there was a connection between that clip and the and the movie Midnight Run? Did you see that? No. Have you seen that movie? I did not. Oh well, it's a classic comedy, and uh, Robert De Niro plays a bounty hunter, and Charles G- Grodin plays a, a mob accountant by the name of Jonathan Mardukas, the very name used by for the accountant in that clip. So the screenwriter must have been having a little fun at referencing the comedy. And Good that's day. why you're legendary producer <laughs> Dave, because absolutely nothing gets by David Yass. Thank you. Our featured guest this week on the Shine Up podcast is Catherine Sanderson. 
Catherine is a professor at Amherst College and the chair of psychology. She's the author of several books, including The Positive Shift, Mastering, Mindset to Improve Happiness, Health, and Longevity, and The Bystander Effect, and Why We Act, Turning Bystanders into Moral Rebels. Her talks and work, they've been featured in numerous media outlets, including The Washington Post, The Boston Globe, USA Today, CNN, CBS Morning, with Jane Pauley. She also writes a weekly blog for Psychology Today, Norms Matter, that examined the power of social influence on virtually all aspects of our lives. Catherine, it's nice enough to join us. I appreciate the time. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for this invitation to talk about such an important topic. Catherine, you mentioned the important topic, and that topic is, is happiness. And it's always great to talk about happiness. It's something we want, it's something we want to feel and truly experience, yet it feels like it's something so hard to wrap our hands around that feeling of pure happiness. With the world and the times that we're living in, 18 months and counting into a global pandemic, and with this being such a hard time for all of us for different reasons, a time of loss, a time of transition, a time of loneliness, and also a time of self-reflection, what impact do you see the pandemic having on the way we now perhaps prioritize happiness and our search for it? Well, so what an important question. And so I actually think that this period of time, again, 18, 19 months in, has really given a lot of people an opportunity to do important self-reflection. So what am I doing? How am I spending my time? One of the key findings from the field of positive psychology is that we have an opportunity to learn and grow during times of adversity. And I want to point to three things in particular. One, when we experience adversity, we get much better at savoring the small moments of daily life. So I remember when the pandemic hit, I emailed all of my students and said, so sorry, we're moving to Zoom learning. And I had so many of them reach out to me after and say, I miss seeing your face. I miss being in a classroom with everyone. Now, let me just say, I was teaching at 8.30 in the morning, which if you're a college student is like unbearably early. And so they would show up, they would sit in this lecture hall with baseball hats on, looking disheveled. None of them appreciated me or each other or the room. And now all of a sudden, being in a physical space this year, we're back to in-person teaching. Students are so excited to be there. My class is so interactive and talky, and I think that's entirely because they didn't know what they were missing. So so I'm going to point to that as, as one, I think, key example of something that we are all getting better at savoring walking into Starbucks, seeing family and friends in a way that we didn't really appreciate two years ago, right? Well, it's a great point, and, and Catherine, for some people, happiness, it comes easy. For others, it doesn't. And for some people, the glass is always half half full. The day at work was always the best day you've ever had. It doesn't matter if you had an argument with your spouse, a disagreement with your coworker. The day, well, it was it was a great one. But for others, and I would think most people, happiness doesn't come all that natural. And the positive mindset that you talk about in your book, it's so important to how we shape our ability to find happiness. From your research and from meeting people all over the world, your talks, your lectures, your classes, what category do you find most people fall into and why? So really important question. And and so I'll say two things. One, a lot of the research sort of broadly would would describe people as being about 50-50. So about 50% of people kind of tend to be a little bit more optimistic, sort of the glasses uh, is half full and the silver lining, and about half of people tend not to be. So that's what the sort of broader research would say. Now, When I'm doing talks, including Zoom talks now, I actually always start with a poll question. And here's the poll question. Are you more of a kittens and rainbows people? Can you always find that silver lining? Or are you not? And and what's interesting is that when I do this poll, again, which is entirely anonymous online, 
about 75% of people say not a kittens and rainbows person. <laughs> and so I don't know if that means that people are coming to my talk because they're like, help, I need to find that silver lining. Or I'm talking to a lot of like lawyers and people in finance and parents of teenagers. So maybe I'm just hitting the audience of people who's not that happy. But in my own experience, it's actually skewed to about 75% of people don't particularly describe themselves as all that naturally happy. Catherine, you mentioned Kittens and Rainbows, and it brings me back to the introduction of your book and a story that you open up with, which I think is incredibly powerful. And you mentioned that after one of your talks, a woman came up to you and complimented the talk. She loved it, but she also told you that she was almost not going to attend because she thought by the end of it, I think your exact words, that she would strangle you because you would talk about Kittens and Rainbows. So with that as a backdrop, tell us about that moment, that encounter, and what led you to write your book? So thank you for, for mentioning that, because honestly, I think that when many people hear, like that woman, and, and maybe like members of your audience, when they hear professors coming on to talk about the science of happiness, there's this assumption that I'm going to be really irritating, that I'm going to be all about the kittens and rainbows and whatever. And, and so what that person said was exactly that. She thought she would hate me. And she said, I'm so glad I went to your talk because I didn't hate you. I actually didn't hate you. And, and the reason why I actually think I can give this talk and, and why I wrote this book is that I am not someone who naturally and easily finds happiness, that I'm somebody who struggles to feel happy. I have a, a family history of depression and bipolar disorder. So I'm somebody, frankly, who comes from a long line of worriers and people who are the opposite of kittens and rainbows. I, I often tell a story now that in the first few weeks of the pandemic, I was sitting in my bed and I would like scroll on my cell phone. Uh, for like symptoms of coronavirus and the spread in my community and how many ventilators are available and you know, all of this sort of rumination and panic. And, and what was fascinating is I started getting emails and in a couple of cases, a physical like letter in my box. And they were from strangers, people who had heard me talk about happiness or had bought my book. And, and one woman in particular, I remember she said, Every day I open up your book to some random page and I read a page and it's always helpful, especially during this time of the pandemic. And, and I was like, I should read that book. Like that sounds really helpful um, because again, it was not something that I naturally did. And so the important point of that is that for those of us who aren't naturally the kittens and rainbows people, there are specific strategies and steps that we can use to feel happier, even if it doesn't come to you naturally naturally and easily. Catherine, you mentioned the, the strategies and I'm sure everybody listening wants to know what's the secret pill to finding happiness that, that you can take? What are the steps? What are the strategies? Tell us some of those important steps and strategies that you mentioned in the book. Yeah. So th there are five things that I mentioned in the book. I actually have five different chapters, the final section of the book, each of these. But before I tell you the strategies, which I will, I want to also say that happiness is individual. And I say that because sometimes I hear a person will say, well, I meditate and my sister won't, or my friend always does this and I don't. So that happiness is not one size fits all. So what works for you might be different for what works for your spouse or your child or your boss or your colleague or your neighbor. That being said, some of the very consistent findings, one, spending time in nature, that people who spend time in nature overwhelmingly report better health and also better happiness. And that doesn't have to be, I'm going to move to Wyoming or go camping or something. It can even be taking a walk in Central Park in the middle of an urban environment. So spending time in nature is very consistently associated with well-being. Two, giving. And I love the giving one because like anything counts. Uh, people who do a random act of kindness for a stranger, you pay for the coffee behind them in the drive-thru, higher levels of happiness. People who donate money to charity, higher levels of happiness. People who volunteer in their communities, higher levels of happiness. And then the third, and really the most important, high quality relationships. And, and, and I say high quality relationships because what really matters is not having a you know, big giant social network. What matters is having some people in your life, friends, family members, dating partners, whatever, who you can have real and authentic and intimate conversations with. That's what really matters.
And Catherine, we're going to get to the impact and importance of those close relationships, because as a family law attorney, I want to talk about happiness and marriage, which I know you reference in your book. But I want to go back to something you said, which is it's individual to each of us. And so what do our personalities suggest and indicate about our ability to find happiness in the short term and the long term? Yeah, really, really important question. Um, I'm going to give an anecdote, which I think perfectly illustrates how different people find happiness in different situations. And I'm so glad that you're addressing that because I honestly think in our society, sometimes you get the message, well, everybody has to read fiction or everybody has to meditate or everybody has to whatever. And in fact, happiness is very individual. So at the time when the pandemic hit in March of 2020, I had two sons who were in college. Now, my oldest child was a junior in college. He is an absolute extrovert. So he comes home, starts doing college in his room, and he is miserable. He misses his friends. He misses his roommate. He misses his fraternity brothers. He misses participating in intramural sports. And he's just lonely and sad and depressed. In fact, in what is a personal sort of fail moment, he was taking at the time a class I teach in social psychology. He's a psychology (laughs) major. And he took a pass fail in this class that is like my passion and my life's work. Sure. And I was like, how could you take a pass? In, in <laughs> anyway, Talk about he, a tough conversation with, with your own son. It was, it was, it was a very tough conversation. Then I had another child, my, my, my middle child, who was a freshman in college. Robert is a real introvert. He's the kind of kid who invites three people to his birthday parties. He was happy as could be with the pandemic. He didn't like having a roommate at college. He has his own room at home. He didn't always (laughs) like the college dining hall. He has his own food here. He had a high school girlfriend who he was doing long distance with. (gasps) All of a sudden, they're both quarantined together. He found it very intimidating to raise his hand in a big college lecture hall. You know what he liked? Zoom chat. The raise your hand function in a Zoom chat room. He made Dean's List. He had straight A's. And so that's an example about how different people find happiness in different ways and different circumstances. That's such an incredible example. And I want to ask you, what is often misunderstood about happiness? I think a lot. I mean, to be honest, I think a lot. So I think thing number one is that I think many people think, I will be happy when, right? I will be happy when. I will be happy when I graduate from college. I get a job. I make partner. I buy a house. I retire. I win the lottery. It's it's the I will be happy when. And, And therefore, happiness is always elusive because it's always just around the corner. It's always a year or two out, I'll be happy. I'll be happy when. And so I think that we underestimate of how much we adapt to given circumstances. So we can probably all imagine a time in our lives in which we think, if I just had an extra $5,000, I would be happier. And then you, you know, reach that climate and you're like, well, you know, about five is not really doing it. I think what I really need is money, (laughs) you know? And so, so I think we underestimate the power of adaptation. I think that we also underestimate our ability to adjust. So, I taught this morning to a room full of students wearing masks while I wore a mask. And if you had told me two years ago, I was going to have to teach wearing a mask, I would be like, well, no, I would never be happy sure. doing that. You know, and I can't even see their faces. I don't even know who most of them are. You know, they wear hats, they have masks. I mean, I see like an eye sliver. And yet, yeah, I, I like it. it. It feels pretty normal. We fly on airplanes wearing masks. We go to Starbucks wearing a mask. And and we actually mostly have adapted. Now it's not great. My ears kind of hurt by the end of a long flight, (laughs) but we're doing it. And, And so I think, again, we underestimate how much we adapt. And we, we also, I think, underestimate how much of happiness is within our own control. I think many people think, well, some people are genetically lucky and they're happy and some people are not. And I think we underestimate how much happiness is about our own personal effort. And that's actually why I love talking about it and writing about it. Catherine, I want to talk about a topic, and as a family law attorney, I see people in my office going through a very difficult and tough time, couples who were separating, couples who were going through divorce, and so let's talk about happiness and marriage, and as soon as I say those two words together, I'm sure people are thinking to themselves, is that even possible, and I think talking about happiness and marriage 
it's hard to do without mentioning that the divorce rate, nearly 50% of the people approximately end up separating and end up splitting up. And many more couples stay together and stay married, but they're not happy. And people stay together for all different reasons, financial, children, the fear of being alone, the stigma of divorce. And you talk about in your book, the importance and impact of close relationships on happiness. So specifically with marriage, what does the research suggest? What did you find? And what's the impact of marriage on our overall level of happiness? So close relationships are extraordinarily important. And marriage, of course, is for many people, their very closest relationship. But the data on happiness in marriage is complex for a couple of different reasons. So one, and, and I'm now going to talk sort of historically, and I want to I really make a point that this is a historical finding. Historically, what research has shown is that marriage is very good for end of story. Marriage is very good for men, that, that men who are married are happier, they're healthier, they live longer, they're less likely to be hospitalized for psychiatric disorders, and, and really married to anyone is good for men. Historically, the data on the science of happiness in women has been a little bit different. What the research on the science of happiness in marriage for women has shown that good marriage is good, that happily married women are happier and healthier than single women, and that bad marriage is actually very bad, that women who are in unhappy marriages are less happy and less healthy. So historically, the research has shown that marriage is generally good for men and that women benefit from good marriage and really are debilitated by bad marriage. If you ask married couples, who is your best friend? Men overwhelmingly say, can you guess? Men say, who's your best friend? Men say, wife. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what I said. That's right. It was not a trick question. But but here's the other one. If you ask women who's your best friend, what do they say? My best friend. They that's don't right. say husband. So so that's an example of sort of my marriage. Yep. Yeah, it is interesting, right? Now, now I'm gonna pause to say a lot of that data historically fails to take into account two things. One, typically, historically, men worked outside the home, women did not. And so there may be, in fact, be a difference in which each people are much more likely now to be earning money um, and also for men to be actively involved in taking care of kids and sort of household tasks in a way that historically didn't happen. We also do not yet have good data on same-sex marriage. And so that's really a missing link because that just hasn't been around historically long enough for us to say, is this a gendered finding, et cetera. Now, all that being said, what we know is that good marriage is good for everyone, that, that it gives you support, it gives you companionship, it gives you, again, intimacy, sexual and beyond emotional intimacy, and it's extremely good. We also know that living in a state of conflict and that bad marriage can feel lonely and isolating and actually can be detrimental for your health. And Catherine, I think during the course of a marriage and a relationship, there's certain life events that take place the birth of a child, a promotion, and you mentioned that. But these are all things that take work. Parenting, it's great, it's wonderful, but it is an incredible amount of work, whether you have a toddler or you have two sons who you're putting through college. And so do you find that people discount or not give enough credit to the work that it takes to find happiness in a marriage? Yes, and and, and I think... One of the key points that you also raised just now was also parenthood. So you asked before, what misconceptions do we have? One of the key misconceptions that we have is about the transition within a marriage, which most marriages end up at some point having children, something like 90% of marriages end up having children. Um, and we overwhelmingly underestimate the impact of becoming a parent on what that does to the marriage. In the spring semester, I teach a class on close relationships, a seminar, and we talk at length about this underestimation that when people think about having a baby, they think, oh, I'm going to paint the nursery and buy new furniture and we're going to choose a name and people are going to give us gifts and there'll be this adorable, you know, little um, baby around. And there's a wonderful quote by the author, Annie Lamott, that says, having a baby is like suddenly getting the world's worst roommate. I, lo I love that. I mean, that, that right there, I mean, because you're right, nobody thinks about that or nobody thinks about the, the, the sleepless nights or, or, or everything that's involved with really raising a child. It's the fun of picking out names and painting the nursery. And then I think when these things happen, the, the effect on the overall relationship and how you may view 
your partner and your spouse. And if you're looking to, to, to your spouse as a source of happiness, I think that people become disappointed. Absolutely. And it's also the case where becoming a parent, even under the best of circumstances, also imposes a tremendous stress. So it is financially expensive to become a parent, whether that means the cost of actually, you know, raising the child, the daycare, nanny, whatever, or somebody stopping work, it's expensive. Uh, sleep deprivation. No one is under their best during times of sleep deprivation. It also reduces the amount of time that couples often spend together. D- doing a date night, traveling independently, the things that used to give people pleasure can all of a sudden become harder to do. And so at the time of parenthood, people may sort of stop devoting time and attention and effort on the marriage, on their relationship, and be sort of translating and transferring that energy to the child. And that over time can be really debilitating for the marriage relationship. Catherine, you mentioned date night and how it may be, how it may be difficult for parents to find that time for themselves. There's a chapter in your book, and I would love to get into the research. What does it suggest the different times in our lives based on age and the link between age and happiness, when there might be a time when it might be easier to do those fun things when children are in college and parents find themselves having more time for themselves. Yeah, so I, I sort of feel like I should give like a trigger warning now or something for your audience. <laughs> um, but but the, the bad news is uh, for most of us, including me right now, is that happiness tends to be in something that research across the world. So this is not an American finding. This is a universal finding. Does something called a U-shaped curve. So there's a pretty famous U-shaped happiness curve, which means across every culture that's been studied, people that are around 50. So again, it, it kind of varies 47, 48, 52, whatever. But in the sort of time of midlife, often experience lower levels of happiness. This, of course, is what corresponds with what we think about as a midlife crisis in our society. It's also perhaps coincidentally an age at which many people have teenagers living in their home. And, and then in what I think is very good news for everyone is that happiness tends to increase in your 60s and your 70s and they've studied people up to about age 85 so this is a really important finding because what it says is that happiness in fact does increase with age and so for those of us who are now in the sort of low point and and when i'm which is right me, I'm in my early 50s right now, but I am really holding out for that 60s and 70s <laughs> period, which I, which I see coming. My my youngest right now is 17, senior in high school. So my husband and I are, are really actively counting down month by month. Uh, to what we are very much hoping will be the empty nest period in about 10 months. So fingers crossed for me. I was going to say counting down the days until uh, your, your son's off to college. Yeah. But, but, but how do we reconcile that with what all of us keep hearing now, with is, which is this divorce boom, the great divorce, which is divorce in older couples. So as we try to, to look at the research and the science and the statistics, you're hearing about more and more people who are separating later in life, in their 60s, in their 70s. Is there a relationship between happiness and what people may want out of life and yet also wanting to find that separate and apart from the relationship that they're currently in? Oh, what a fascinating question. Uh, So I'm going to say two things. One, my in-laws about four or five years ago celebrated 50 years of marriage. Wow. Right, pretty. You, you don't you don't hear that too. You you know, too, too much, yeah? <laughs> um, so to honor at, for their party, they had a really fabulous celebration in a big hotel ballroom. I got them a little plaque, and the plaque said, "The first fifty years of marriage are the hardest." And that, to me, illustrates, of course, that marriage is hard. Right, marriage isn't easy. But but here's the other thing that that really juxtaposes, I think, the intent of your question. What has changed about marriage? Well, what's changed? Our life expectancy has changed. So if you went back 100 years ago, people lived to about 40 or 50. So you know what? You really couldn't have a marriage of more than 20 or 30 years because you only had a life expectancy of 40 or 50. What has changed dramatically with the advent of vaccines and medical care and treatment and so on, frankly, better hygiene, better health conditions, is that we are now living into our 70s and 80s and and 90s. And therefore, marriage that used to be sort of 20 or 30 years now technically could be 50 or 60 years and so on. And what may change 
is that we may evolve, that we may change in terms of what we're looking for. We may change in terms of what we're hoping to have and how we're spending our lives. And that means that people in their 60s or 70s may be saying, you know what, we did it. We raised our kids. We've had a fulfilling marriage in some cases, but the love has faded or what, or we're go- growing in different directions. And what we're looking for, in fact, is very different. And to me, that also is a recognition that what fits your needs for people in their early 20s, when perhaps a marriage started, may not be the same needs and fulfillment that they're looking for in their 60s or 70s. Catherine, it's such a great point. And we talked about the impact of marriage and happiness. And now I want to talk about money and happiness. And there's a section in your book titled The Hazards of Materials. And you write about temptation, the temptation that people feel the temptation that people think that happiness lies in acquiring more and more things, stuff, possessions. People often equate money with happiness. Does money equal long-lasting happiness? And what's problematic with that idea? So that I think is also one of the biggest misconceptions that we have. There is a sense of if I just had a little bit more money, if I could buy more things, if I could have a nicer house, et cetera, a better car and so on. And the challenge with looking for happiness in money is, is really complex. And it's complex for a few reasons. One, as we talked about earlier, we very much adapt. We adapt and we adapt and we adapt. So you buy a nicer house, then you're in a nicer neighborhood where other people have even nicer houses. And you think, boy, I wish I had an even nicer house or a better car to go with that house or so on. Again, this idea of adaptation is really problematic. The other key is that when you are living in a more affluent area, a more affluent life, the nature of your comparisons also changes. And those comparisons can make us feel worse. There's a wonderful quote that's actually the title of one of the chapters of my book, which is, comparison is the thief of joy. And that's a quote by Teddy Roosevelt, but I think that's really epitomizes this idea of when we start comparing ourselves to other people, it can make us feel much worse. And our possessions, our belongings, our wealth is pretty tangible that you can see it around. Oh, here's the car I drive. Here's the ring I have, et cetera. Here's this fabulous vacation I just took and so on. And when we start looking for happiness It's never ending if we're looking for it in terms of the sense of comparison, because you know what? There will always be somebody who is wealthier and better off financially in terms of their belongings than we are. It's a never ending search. And you mentioned the comparison. I would think in a a day and age where technology and social media and Instagram and Facebook rules the day, it is easier now than ever before to make that comparison, to perhaps be happy in the moment, but then want the bigger house, to want the more expensive vacation, to look at everybody else, people who you don't even know, and to see what else is out there because you can download the Facebook and Instagram app. And so that comparison that you mentioned, it's even, I would think, more concerning due to the accessibility of technology and how easy it is to look at what else is out there in terms of would this or that make me happier? 100%. And the challenge of that comparison, of course, is that it's about everything, right? It's about, well, here is the a vacation I took. Oh, here are my uh, front row seats to Hamilton or the Super Bowl. Oh, here's how I look in a bathing suit, which is definitely not something that I'm posting ever on, on my own. <laughs> um, but, but again, so it's about everything, right? It's about, here's my kid. He's going to Harvard and he's valedictorian. So it's about everything. It's about every single aspect of our lives we can do this comparison on. I, I say to my teenage children all the time, I am lucky to be old enough that when I was in high school, I never had to see pictures of parties I wasn't invited to. It's true. You didn't didn't know what else was out there. And and I would think though, in the impact of of social media and technology, it extends far beyond that. It it, it in many ways has taken the place of in-person, meaningful conversations, which from reading your book and, and looking at the research, there is an impact on our relationships and the quality of our conversations, if they're taking place at all due to technology. 
And even the mere presence of our cell phones, one of the studies that my college students find, I think particularly scary, <laughs> is, is frankly, the mere presence of a cell phone turned off and on a table between two strangers lowers the quality of conversation. The mere presence of that phone on a table, again, turned off, leads people to be less intimate, less vulnerable, less authentic. And so even the presence of our phones that allow for technology can actually lead to less intimate, vulnerable conversations, precisely the kind of conversations we need to be engaging in to build and maintain high quality, close relationships. Absolutely. And <clears throat> Catherine, what's it like for you to write this book? I know you have a, a, a new book out. What's it like to lecture on the topic of happiness, to know that you're influencing so many people, especially during a time that we're living in right now, where so many people have anxiety and have fears and are going through such a difficult time? What's it like for you to have this book out there, your new book out there, and, and know that you're making such an incredible difference in the lives of people? Well, that's a, that's a very uh, generous question um, from you. But I will say that, that, as you can probably tell from our conversation, and as you can probably tell from reading my book, which, by the way, you've done a super duper job of, often I start these interviews and the person starts by saying, I didn't actually read your book, which is you know, <laughs> always uh, kind of awkward. But anyway, but I love talking about happiness. I love talking about psychology. And I love having a sense of giving people the tools. So what I really love doing is reading the nerdy empirical literature. I remember somebody put a review of my book, I think on Amazon or Goodreads or something. And they said, well, I like the book, but you know, there was just so much research and so many studies. And I'm like, yes, that, that is that is what the book is. Because, um, and it's not just my opinion. I woke up one morning and was like, I'll write this book about the thing. None of this is my opinion. All of this is, this is what the empirical research in psychology and economics and neuroscience and biology, this is what the empirical research tells us will make us happy. And so what I'm really trying to do is to give people tools that they can use. And one of the reasons why why I so love talking about this topic and so appreciate this opportunity to have this conversation with you is that we all benefit from living in a world with more people who are happy, right? It's, it's good for all of us if there is more happiness in the world. And so for me to be able to share these secrets from the empirical research with a broader audience brings me great joy is super meaningful. Catherine, thank you very much for coming on the Shine On podcast. I know you speak often and regularly about topics such as the science of happiness, the power of emotional intelligence, the art of aging well, and the psychology of courage and in action. And you have a, a recent book out. Tell us about that book and how you ended up writing that. Oh, well, thanks for that question. So this is really uh, a hard story, but my oldest child about Four years ago now, we dropped him off at college for his start of his freshman year. We went to Walmart and bought a mini fridge and rug, and we hung posters around his room. We hugged him goodbye and drove home. And I didn't hear much from Andrew for the first couple of weeks of college. He was you know, pretty independent. Occasionally, there'd be a text like, how do I do laundry or something like that? But we really didn't hear much <laughs> from him. And then... Two weeks after we dropped him off, my phone rang late one night and he said, mom, a student in my dorm died. And this was a kid who was 19 years old. He was a freshman in college, two weeks in. And, and Andrew told me the story. And the story is one that even if you don't know this particular case, it will seem familiar because it happens all the time. The kid was drinking. He fell and hit his head. His friends and roommate watched over him for hours because they wanted him to be okay. They checked to make sure he was still breathing. They strapped a backpack around his shoulders to prevent him from rolling onto his back and vomiting and then choking to death. So they, they looked over him. They wanted him to be okay. They cared about him. But what they didn't do for 19 hours was call 911. And when they finally made the call, the kid was brought immediately by ambulance to the local hospital, but it was too late. They kept him on life support so his family could fly in from out of town to be with him when he died. And as a mom of three and as a college professor to many, I just, I could not get that story out of my mind because all I could think about was 
if one of those kids had made a call earlier, maybe that student would have lived. And so my latest book, Why We Act, Turning Bystanders into Moral Rebels, is a deep exploration of why good people like those kids in that dorm room, why good people so often fail to speak up in all different kinds of situations from bullying in schools to sexual misconduct in college to corporate fraud and so on. And again, I'm really hoping that that book can give people tools to speak up in the face of all different kinds of situations. Catherine, it's such a heartbreaking and powerful story and you're right. And what I love about that book and the book, The Positive Shift, it touches on things that whether you're a parent or not, it's real It's aspects of our lives that all of us go through on one level or another. Your books, The Positive Shift, Why We Act, and The Bystander Effect, incredible thought-provoking questions. And you provide us a look into the research and the science, again, on things that really touch our lives daily. Catherine, tell everybody where we can learn more about your work, your research, and find the copies of the books. Great. Um, Thank you so much. So I have a website, sandersonspeaking.com, where people can actually see videos of talks I've given, as I like to say, full body talks, which sounds much more risque than it actually is. But it's talks that I used to give before the pandemic in which I would wear shoes. Uh, And my books are available everywhere. They're certainly on Audible and Amazon. I like to really push independent bookstores that are really struggling during this time of the pandemic in particular. And I'm on Instagram at Sanderson Speaking and on Twitter at Sanderson Speaks. Catherine, again, <clears throat> this is really terrific. Thank you very much for coming on. It was a pleasure speaking with you and having you on the show. Thank you for the wonderful questions. I have so enjoyed our conversation. Wow, what an absolutely incredible show. It doesn't get better than this. Episode number 23 in the books. Incredible interview with author and professor Catherine Sanderson. Her book, Positive Shift, Mastery Mindset to Improve Happiness, Health, and Longevity. Absolutely terrific. This is the book for you to help you improve both the quality and longevity of your life. To all the listeners, thank you for listening. David Yass, my guy, thank you as always. My pleasure, my treasure. Everyone can keep sending in your emails and comments to Evan at shineanddivorce.com. You can find this episode and the complete archive of episodes along with the blog post featuring our fantastic guest on my website, shawnadivorce.com. You can subscribe, follow, and find the podcast on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, and then all major podcast platforms. I'm Evan Shine, and I'll talk to you again real soon.